Well, hello and welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. It's season three, episode two, and also it's March Madness. And I know what you're thinking, Amanda, you are not the biggest basketball fan. And you're right. I am not the biggest basketball fan. But I felt like I couldn't pass up the opportunity to pit the world's best regions against each other in a competitive yet constructive fashion. And the real question is why? Why are we here to do that? Why would we take our time to pit France against Spain, against Italy? And as I mentioned at the beginning of season three, this season is all about how to be a savvy wine buyer. And part of being a savvy wine buyer is knowing how to decipher and decide between regions when you're out in the wild shopping selecting wine because we've all been there, right? We've all been in a shop or selecting online and we're like, I don't know, like which region should I head to first? That's kind of what this episode's all about. Why would you choose Washington wine over somewhere like Bordeaux? Does Champagne really make the best sparkling wine or are there situations in which perhaps Cava or even Prosecco might make more sense? And what I think is fun is that we've sort of done a lot of episodes dedicated to specific regions and styles of wine, but we've never actually done is taken a look at all of these regions through this sort of macro lens, which is really where you get to put your skills to the test and think kind of like a sum. So we gave you all the basics and now we're putting it to the test. We are sending you out once again into the wild with all the information and ammunition you need. And speaking of psalms, I can see these two sort of wincing. They're like, oh, gosh, no more tests. We're so, we're done with tests. Uh, we've got two psalms with us today. You guys know them. You love them from the Wine Access team, Eduardo and Laura. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having us. This is uh, quite exciting. And we couldn't say no to a fun March Madness wine edition. That's right. And you guys were – so we're all participating in this sort of like March Madness wine edition thing on Instagram. So if you are following both Wine Access and or Wine Access and Culture on Instagram, we've all taken a region and are sort of championing that region through video and through a few different posts. And we're actually letting you guys vote on which you which region you think should come out on top. Laura, you've got France. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I have to, I have to kind of feel like I got the number one seed. I got, yeah, I, I, I got France. I feel like it's mine to lose, um, but I am very open to everyone else's ideas and contributions. I drink from around the world, so I'm not exactly biased, but I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and Eduardo, you think you got like a newcomer, right? I got the U.S. US Go U.S. <laughs> yeah, quite diverse and fun. That's super fun. That's a that's actually a hard one to like put together because we're doing these like little thirty second videos. It's hard to kind of summarize that in thirty seconds. And Eduardo, I know you are a global drinker as well. That I love when we first put up the regions and you were like, "I'll take Japan." I'm like, "Not on the roster, buddy." <laughs> of course, <laughs> you can do it. Like, Come on, why is Japan <laughs> up there? Japan, Japan didn't, didn't even be didn't even qualify. <laughs> Didn't even make the qualifying well, round. High on my list, and then Italy, of course, and but U.S. I mean, we we are in the U.S. and we have such outstanding areas and great producers. Yeah. So it's for you to vote for all of us to enjoy. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, I feel like, and if like for the sports analogy, like the U.S. has some underdog regions, right? Yes. Like we've tasted I, just this year. I've had Arizona wine, mm. Texas wine, like. Um, actually my, my mom right now is in Georgia wine country Ooh. with some friends. Let's not go crazy. Let's not go I crazy. told her, <laughs> yeah, she, she offered to sign me up for the wine club. Um, but I told her we're pretty full on wine right now, oh. but, um, right now I'm actually, uh, taking a break from judging. I'm at the LA international wine competition, which is the oldest in the U S and I just tasted a number of hybrids cool. from all throughout from Missouri to Kansas to you name it, New Mexico, Utah. So every state makes wine in the United talking, States, including Hawaii. We've been to that yeah, little we, thing. We have, we have been to Hawaii so. winery. So you're talking hybrid grapes, right? So not fully All kinds. Vinifera. There's some, okay. some vinifera and then some hybrids. But yeah, every state has to adapt. Uh, we tasted a, a wine from Florida, which I don't know why anybody would make wine in certain parts of Florida, yeah. but they do. And they have this hybrid that adapts to the humidity and the way it's produced. And it's fascinating. So hybrid grapes, for those wondering, you know, in the wine world, we always talk about Vitis vinifera, which is your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Sauvignon Blanc, your Cabernet Franc, Merlot. Those are all part of the Vitis vinifera family. And that's mostly what's been planted for years and years and years. But because 
grapes are trying to be grown in these other places, some of these varietals can't really survive in colder climates, more heat, uh, hot climates, mildew, heavy climates, or even places like Florida that don't have like real seasons. And so these hybrid varieties are effectively a variety between Vitis lambrusca and Vitis vinifera that they crossbreed to make them a little bit more compatible. So you're seeing a lot more of it. It used to be that nobody touched hybrids in like a real way. Like some's were like, ugh, hybrid grapes. But you are seeing with, you know, with climate change, you're you're seeing a lot more winemakers take them seriously. And so when you see them out in the wild, you know, take a peek. They might be better than you expect. Absolutely. Japan. Japan actually has a wide variety of, of hybrids. When I started judging and tasting a lot of wines in Japan, I was subjected to those. And yeah, they're interested. Let's leave it at that. All roads lead back to Japan. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh man. Oh, I love it. Well, speaking of all roads leading back, we're going to be coming back to you in just a second with what's going on in the wine world and a super exciting story around that. All right, you guys, I'm sure you're both familiar with the winery Patson Hall, right? Mm-hmm. Classic yes. California yes, producer, yes, yes. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. They were purchased, as you might remember, a few years ago by St. Michel Wine Estates. And uh, Donald Patz departed, started his own thing. But James Hall actually stayed on for a little while and kind of you know, was overseeing winemaking and working on this. In any case, um, Something super exciting is happening because we all hear about wineries being purchased and kind of going off, you know, into the sunset. And but in this case, uh, James Hall is coming back to his roots, back, and he baby. bought back yeah. Hudson Hall. How exciting is that? That's amazing. Couldn't have happened to somebody that uh, believes and has all that attention to detail and everything. And that's his baby. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just an amazing. I was talking to a few people today about it, and uh, I, I'd say it's it's like a Disney story. Yeah, it's a perfect Disney story for the wine totally. world. Totally, yeah. And at sixty five years old, you know, at, at a time when most people are thinking about retirement, and as he said, you know, you can only play so much golf, right? Interesting. Saint Michel Wine Estates has been offloading a lot of their California wineries, mm-hmm. and they famously um, just parted ways with Stag's Leap Wine Cellars to their partner Antonori. Mm-hmm. And so they've really been focusing on the Pacific Northwest, but uh, I love, which we we should definitely like, I think C is maybe a, a marker of some sort, but um, I love that mm-hmm. James, you know, at 65 has decided that like, he just, he wants it back. It's his, he built it from the ground up and here we are. And, and I can say having known him really actually over these last eight years, like he is, I, I can't, like he never stepped away. Mm. You know, he was always, he was still winemaker emeritus. He was still... I'm really hands-on focused on everything that winery is. So I, besides maybe some names on the paper and like where this all goes, like he has been in this a hundred percent as, you know, as if it were his own for the past 10 years, Yeah, you know, underneath, underneath them. So feels like the right continuation, but it is, it wasn't, it was a shocking story because we just don't see that yeah. very it, often where the, the, Oh, get sold back to the yeah. <laughs> I, I can't think of an example of the top exactly. of my head. No. Yeah, I can't think of any other time that it that it's happened. I'm sure there is maybe some some time that it's happened before, but super exciting. You know, I don't know if that's a trend that we'll see more of, but I definitely wanted to spotlight yeah. that because I I love Pat's and all. That was actually I used to tell Donald Pat's this when I worked in New York. One of the very first like expensive bottles of wine that I bought for myself was a bottle of Pat's and Hall Chardonnay, and I remember going around the to the corner store and like. It was like thirty dollars, and I was like, "I don't know if I can afford this," but I did it <laughs> with the beautiful, the beautiful cartouche on the out, the embossing yes. on the on the bottle. It's just like such an iconic. Those wines are so good. I I know, I probably all three of us have had one of their wines by the glass on one of our programs. Yes, 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 iconic. And yes. I I I'm yeah. very excited <laughs> to see how they continue that brand because it is it's an iconic Napa brand, or iconic California brand, and um, one that I think should have legs. In other news, <laughs> y'all remember uh, Rudy, your near one? <laughs> Kier- 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 oh, sure. No. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard about this. What's oh, happening? My is he here? Is he, is he our fourth guest? Okay. He's not here. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm not, okay. I'm not opposed to it. Um, he may want to be back, though, because he is trying to return to the spotlight and succeeding. So 
apparently, so for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, Rudy Kinirawan, he, am I saying that right? Kinirawan. I think you are. No, it sounds good. Yes, Kinirawan. Uh, yeah. Rudy Kinirawan is leaning into his criminal celebrity. His lawyer, Jerry Mooney, is going on the record to confirm that Kinirawan, who is now 51, is being hired to create fake versions of 1990 DRC Romani Conti and 1990 Trues. And just to back up for those who are like, who the hell is this guy? If you've ever seen this like documentary, Sour Grapes, this guy for like years was fooling the entire wine industry by going to auctions, buying tons and tons of wine, with crazy amounts of money, like outbidding like the Koch brothers, right? Like crazy amounts mm-hmm. of dollars. But that's not what he got famous for. He got famous because he ended up faking all of these wines and duping all of these people because he would then sell these wines. And so, I mean, it was like millions and millions of dollars of fake wine that he ended up getting arrested Arrested and went to jail for like 10 years. This is a great story and I'm not telling it super well, so you should go watch the documentary. Um, But he's back. (laughs) I have to say- how is he on record going to make his wines again? I would would want to taste his approximation of a wine. I would want, I definitely would. I, and I actually was talking to someone recently that is, you know, 99.9% sure they have one of Rudy's bottles mm-hmm. and hasn't opened it. And it's, it, it, that in, in it of itself is kind of a collectible thing Oh, because Rudy's point. become famous and his bottles have become famous. So like, I understand a lot of these people that ended up buying these bottles and don't want to admit that half their sellers fake. Yeah. I do understand that. But if you have like one or two that you're like, I know that Rudy made this in his condo in LA, it it's definitely maybe not as valuable as what the label should like if it were real, but it is still really cool. And I'd be super curious. Oh my God. That I've never thought blend. about that point that until now, but that's you're absolutely right. It is truly one of a kind. And like, say what you want about the guy. I mean, he went to it jail. A, it was an it was an yeah. impressive thing that he was pulling off because he was he was duping everybody. And apparently the wine's really pretty good that he was making. So I would be curious to try it. Pretty damn close where people didn't pick it up. Yeah. Even seasoned collectors and even producers yeah. sometimes. And, didn't. and I would think that there's probably, you know, as the, like people that will come out and like ha- get a bottle that's made by Rudy, authenticated that it's made by him. Oh and we'll even see those in an auction house. Like it'll all be like, you know, the snake eating no. its own tail. Yes, I think she's right. I want those bottles. I think you're right, Laura. I think there there will be a market for these wines, especially now that he's like – you know, officially been convicted and now he's kind of coming into his like, you know, I I liken it to like the Anna, Anna Delvies of the world or, um, Mm -hmm. oh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard, like these criminals who are now like celebrity status. I think he could like, so he's going to be making wine, uh, admittedly from. So, yeah. So I I just wrote his business plan. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess like he's basically, you know, gone the route of some other politicians and is using his, his lawyer as his PR team. He's not going on the personally going there, but he's letting his lawyer say that, yeah, he is like producing wines in Asia for clients who want basically fakes. And I think, you know, it's sort of similar. We see this in, in the luxury sector with other things too, with like handbags. Mm-hmm. This is obviously super popular. And even at, you know, the upper echelon of things, right? Like it's well documented that even the most wealthy women who carry Birkins and Kelly's and rare Louis Vuittons, even they have a mix of fake bags in their collection. And I could, I can see a world in which this could kind of slide in that same genre and, you know, potentially be a collectible as well. Or I think you're spot on with that. My argument would be um, back when he started doing this, I don't know, I got too deep the rabbit hole, but when he started doing this sort of things, there was no documentation. Nobody had really done that to that level, right? So people were full right and left. They were looking at labels and corks and all these things. They weren't doing that like with the with the microscope, mm-hmm. with the magnifying glass, if you will. But now people are aware, so it's going to be harder for him to make a, a DRC, you name it, right, Pornzo, whatever wine, because now people are actually expecting it, so they're aware. They're like heightened alert. Yeah, I I agree with you, but I think you know there's. As Maureen Downey, who is now like the world's leading wine fraud expert, will tell you, like, there is so few people who are truly specialized in finding fraudulent bottles. And really, their only job to do that is going to be at auction. And that's not where these wines are going. They're being sold in the black market just like any other fake bag or fake watch or whatever would be sold. And I think, 
you know, the people that are buying these wines know that they're buying fake wines and their intent isn't to get them authenticated. Their intent is to take them to a party and be like, look what I have. Like, isn't this so cool? Because if you have a seller, right, and you have one DRC from, Mm -hmm. you know, 1945, right? And you're like, Rudy, make me five more. Yeah. Like, I want to be able to bring out a case of them. Yeah. You know, like, I... I get it. Yeah. If you, if you went over I, someone's I house. <laughs> no, if you went over someone's house that had enough money and they showed you, you know, rare wines that they had amidst a collection of other things, right? If they were like, here's my Sutter home and a bottle of DRC, you may be like, mm-hmm. <laughs> perhaps not. But, you know, we've all been in these houses where like people have these crazy collections and you, would you, sec- would you think for a second that they'd have like fakes in there? Like I wouldn't. I'm here for the Netflix series. I need I need all of the Instagram, all of the Netflix, all the things that like these celebrity criminals are doing. Like I need all of this for Rudy. So yes. if you're listening, I don't we support what we you're doing, more. but I, I am watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking of supporting, if you guys want to support this podcast, you can do so by making sure that you're subscribed and leaving us a review preferably the five-star kind. If you have feedback, we're always open to it. But, you know, <laughs> privately totally would be nice. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing you can do is come and drink with us. Support us in uh, in drinking along with the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast Wine Club. We've got four wines for you every two months. I pick them with these guys right here. We have a, a lovely mm-hmm. conversation going around the clock all the time looking for great wines for you guys. And that's what gets selected. So, Every wine, as you know, goes with an episode of the show. We also do tasting notes with them so you can really dive deep. And as we get into the next chapter of this podcast, you are going to be diving into the box that you hopefully already have to grab the Balboa Myth. This is a beautiful red blend coming from the Walla Walla Valley. And uh, we'll be drinking that when we come back in just a second. All right, you guys, you have some wine? Yes. yes. And uh, being in a hotel, I had to just kind of do away with my uh, hotel. Oh, oh no. How bad is the glassware? Let's so. see it for the for the YouTube. Oh, uh, yeah. What do you got? I actually managed to secure a semi. It's not okay. my Gigi glass, but it's uh, it works. It's not bad. It could be That's worse. Not bad. Yeah. Laura and I are oh, rocking our, our Gabriel glass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we get so to cheers. Jealous. Eduardo, you should, never, you should never leave home. Without your I know teaching. Jonah would be so disappointed. I know, but I've broken so many already. <laughs> the hard way. Because it'll break easy, you know. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's see how I do with this, baby. And hey, excellent. That's work. a good noise. Go. All right. If you guys are drinking with us, you should have the Balboa myth. As I mentioned, this is coming from Walla Walla, Washington, which we will talk about in just a second because the Walla Walla AVA is actually not just in Washington. It does straddle two states, both Oregon and Washington. And the though the back of this wine does say Washington, the majority, the entirety of the fruit in this bottle is actually coming from the Oregon side of the Walla Walla Valley. So this is actually a wine um, made by Tom Glace, who is a legend in Walla Walla. He's been making wine there for like 25 years. He worked at Lea Cole, number 41. But this is his own winery that he started in 99. And the fruit for this wine is coming from two sources. One is the Eidolon Vineyard, which was actually bought by Drew Bledsoe in 2018. If you guys remember, we did a fantastic- Full ep- circle. Yep. Fantastic episode with Drew <laughs> um, about a year ago where he like schooled us on all things Washington and geology. And we were all kind of just sitting there like, wow, this guy, in addition to being like an amazing football player and a vintner, also like knows a shit ton about science. So- here we are. Um, anyway, so he owns this vineyard. It's 18 acres. It's massive. When you when you get there, there's just like massive cobblestones that would remind you of something like Shots Enough to Pop. And this is in the Rocks District located within the Walla Walla ABA on the Oregon side. The other place that this is coming from is the Summit View Vineyard. This is just outside the boundary of the Rocks District, but it's also one of the highest altitude vineyards. This actually sits at about 1,200 feet. So it's that's pretty high. Um, and like I said, on the Oregon side, and this is a blend. This is their top one that they make. It's a blend of 72% Cabernet Sauvignon, 16% Cabernet Franc, and 12% Merlot. And one of the most important facts of all of this is that if you look at the vintage, 
This has a little age on it. It's a 2015. She's almost yeah. she's almost 10 years old. You would not know from tasting no. it. This is no. so youthful. Yeah. Incredible. This is beautiful. Who who found this wine? Do you remember? Uh Chris, actually, part of our team. So yeah, we have the tasting panel and, and we have a team, uh, which is Laura, Sir, uh, me, and then Chris every once in a while like dabs in and finds some great gems from his relationships. Yeah. And yeah, this wine definitely rocked our world, and no pun we, uh, we love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the myth, the name, it's <laughs> it's definitely yeah. proper for yeah. this wine. No, it's it's really good. It's super juicy, but I think what I love about wines from this particular area is that they, for me, similar to the way that Oregon has always sort of straddled the line between California and Burgundy, I think Washington and Walla Walla wines from this area sort of straddle the line between California and Bordeaux. Like there is something very Bordelais about this wine, even though it's juicy and it's rich and you know, there's definitely some like some ripeness to this wine. It has that sort of like gravelly, graphitey thing kind of on the bottom there that you really don't see very much coming out of of California. And structurally, this wine is a totally different beast. You know, I think it, you know, though it's very big, it's also, you know, it's it feels very grounded at the same time. There's an excellent tension to mm-hmm. it. Uh, there's a little cocoa, there's herb, there's slow these things, but it is a very well put together. It's a symphony of a wine. It's not one-sided. It's not like primal. It's not just fruit. It is all together. It's like the whole football team coming at you at the same That's time. Right. There's no treble or bass or anything coming yeah. up at, uh, on its own. I, I am quite excited and thrilled of how delicious is drinking right now, especially. Well, and I'm sure you're extra excited being the representative from U.S. who gets to include this wine in here. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I have to raise I'm the getting, flag high. <laughs> I am getting a little nervous over here for France. No, it's really, it's, it's really elegant. And there's, um, there's, there's definitely an old world quality to, to this as it's kind of aging and opening up. It has that like leather bound book you know, yep. with a little dust on it, kind of that, like that kind of smell, a little bit of sandalwood, which is really, it's really pretty. But then there's that core of that fruit and you're really, the fruit is pristine and, and ripe, but it's kind of sitting in the, in the back a little bit. Totally. Um, and the texture is lovely. I mean, it's still got grip and tannin, but it's very, very smooth. I almost wonder if this wine um, like it, scared people in its youth, you know, a wine, with this right? much age, Probably like just that, came out just too yeah, big. Yeah, like you know, this this wine has like serious structure, and as you said, like it feels so fresh that I I just wonder, you know, when wines are drinking this way, even at that nine, ten, eleven year mark, like you know, I to me, if I had to back up a little bit, I have to wonder if like when this wine came out, they were like, we can't sell this wine right now, like it's not, you know, almost the way that Bordeaux like needs time, like this wine is not ready to drink. And this was this is coming right from the winery, so it's not like it's been hanging around somewhere. Yeah, this is a decision. I think when the winery has the luxury of holding back, like in this case, we were able to secure an allocation of 2015. Think about it. The economics that yeah. goes on holding that wine back, clearly it's just the more it sits there, the more money you're just holding into yeah. it, right? Uh, and that's, to me, it's one of the most fascinating things when you're able to secure those those wines that are completely ready because yeah. to your point maybe in 2017 18 when this wine started to be available or could have been available the consumer would have been i mean or maybe even the the, the winery yeah. maybe tom is the one that made the decision said this is not ready i'm not going to go out there with something representing me and that's pretty cool i i think that's probably exactly what happened but this wine is is really starting to come around in a really beautiful way and i i i actually wouldn't mind grabbing. This is actually a very reasonably priced wine too. I think it's like thirty dollars on Wine Access yeah. right now. Um, and it's, it's crazy. and it's really just hitting that hitting that second gear, third gear where it's just starting to yes. get momentum. Like this has this has you know five Easily ten five years, years yeah. of of time where it's still going to evolve and still going to be this like really powerful expression. Um, so I feel like yeah, like this would be a wine. To, yeah, to drink with us and then stock up on because what a yeah. what a shocker to be able to bring this out in five years. So the way that this is going to work is I'm going to pit the benchmark regions. Uh, you can kind of consider these like the top seeded teams, right? And I think also we always assume 
wrongly that the benchmark region is the greatest, but that's not necessarily the case. The only reason I'm doing that is because this is sort of the region that we measure up to, that other winemakers have looked at as saying, okay, they've been doing it longer. This is kind of what we want to emulate, but you know, it doesn't mean that they haven't been surpassed. So we're going to work through the pros and cons of each to sort of make a semi, a final, hopefully a final call. Um, given that we have a Bordeaux blend in our glass, I thought we would begin there with Bordeaux. And just a reminder, I mean, the point of all of this is to arm you guys with the savviest of knowledge to know when to choose and why. And like, I can sit here and I can explain soil types and the grapes, which is all important, which we've talked about in other episodes. But understanding where these wines fit in the world is sort of like figuring out what movie to watch on a Tuesday, right? Who are you with? What's the Mm. mood? How tired are you? Do you want to think about it? Do you not want to think about it? Um, And so those are all factors that I think we're considering, obviously economics as well, when we are deciding between regions. So to start, we've got Bordeaux, and it's Bordeaux versus California, which of course includes Napa and Paso, Australia, Washington, Argentina, Chile, the Florida Atlantic. And I am including Tuscany <laughs> in here. That's a weird one to include, but I am going to include it. Sure. With a, no, with a sort I think of, it's perfect. Okay. So Bordeaux, obviously pros. They've been doing it for a long time. They've been producing wine since uh, around 43 AD. So a little bit of experience and history on their side. It's the home of the first growth. So you've got Lafitte, Latour, Margot, O'Brien, et cetera, um, which we could argue for or against. Uh, and then cons would be inconsistent vintages. You know, a bad vintage in Bordeaux is Mm -hmm. usually pretty bad. And price, price, though not always. You know, we've we've seen- Not always, but Yeah. Right. Right. So I guess the first question- Which is is tough. Yeah. Oh, because Bordeaux, like, it can almost be like Bordeaux versus Bordeaux in a way. Like, (laughs) there are, because there is a subsection of Bordeaux that is not that- you know, super expensive, super hard to come by, um, you know, uh, rarefied air wines. But but I think as a region, yes, they're be- definitely represented by the, the top the top players. Right. So when are we choosing Bordeaux? What are some of the things that are factoring into the decision when we're like, tonight is Bordeaux night? I gravitate towards Bordeaux when I want to find something with age that I want to feel confident about. Mm. Like if I'm like, you know what, I want to buy a bottle of wine that is a specific vintage for an occasion, a birth year, an anniversary or something where I know it's a good vintage in Bordeaux. It's like that. And if I go and I get a kind of reputable producer in a good year, I am, I am fairly confident that the wine's going to deliver. Like it's a region that has so much history and so much, um, so much experience making long lived wines. Yeah. That like I, I feel like I can count on that as a region. If you were like, oh, find me a bottle, find me the best bottle from you know the '90s, like our birth, all of our birth years, right? Yes, that's a good point. I I don't think I had considered that, but you're right. When people ask me what it, I want to buy something that's from a birth year, it's usually Bordeaux that we go to first. We look to your point. We look for a good producer. It doesn't have to be a first growth. It can be a second growth, a third growth, um, even just you know well known producer. And then a good vintage is key. And I think going back to what I said before, Bordeaux was one of those places that if you hit it in a bad vintage, it's not good. Like they don't do bad vintages particularly well. And to me, that's where other places like California kind of usurp Mm -hmm. Bordeaux in that way. So if we're pitting Bordeaux against California, where does California stack up against Bordeaux? And what would be some reasons to choose California? So Bordeaux, it's a great indicator. It's been doing it forever. It's a great teacher. But I feel like California specifically, as we know, the Napa Valley has surpassed the teacher. And Mm -hmm. a wealth of geology and climate, together with great expertise on how to make the wines, uh, tannin management, all those different things, when to pick all these things, and also gifted with great vintages almost back to back in a general year. I think that just surpasses that. I think when we're talking about Napa in particular, I think what Napa has that Bordeaux does not and will not ever have. And what makes, to me, what makes Napa so interesting are the mountains. Mm, True. Is the distinct mountains, right? Like there is this, there is a quality. And I think the producers and some of which you've mentioned, like that bring, that 
that really do their wines speak to the place that they were made. And they're made on these mountains that have their own distinct microclimate and soil. I agree. I think Napa has a lot more when it comes to terroir diversity. I think there's definitely terroir diversity in Bordeaux, but you're dealing more with style of houses more so mm-hmm. than yep. actual terroir, right? Like you're really splitting hairs there between Lafitte and Latour, for example. I think where it gets in, like, I think there's no question that like at the upper echelon, Napa and Bordeaux can go toe to toe and you really can't lose because price wise, they're pretty comparable as Eduardo mentioned. Um, quality wise, you know, both at the top of their game for sure. I, I don't think that I could venture to say which one is necessarily better. I think where it gets interesting is in that tier below that. So in that like middle Mm -hmm. to like lower tier where I think there is more consistency, you might pay more of a premium for Napa wines, but I think there's more consistency in that middle to lower tier than Bordeaux has. Because as we said, there's inconsistency with vintages. And then you also like, you're very producer dependent. There's Napa is a lot smaller than Bordeaux. Um, And I think that when you're talking about that, there's not a ton of wines in Napa for like 30 to $150. But if you are comparing apples to apples, I do think that's where like Napa does outshine Bordeaux personally. But, and here's where it gets interesting, right? If we're talking about, and this is why this March Madness thing is so fun because, you know, price has to be a factor in this conversation in order for this to work, right? In order for you to go into a store, like you're you're thinking about how much you're going to spend. Where it gets interesting is when you throw places like Washington, where I'm going to say Washington and includes Walla Walla, because to me, that's just more Washington. (laughs) Um, When you throw something like Washington into the mix in that $30 to $100 category, I think that's where Washington kicks everyone's ass. True story. Overall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yes, no there's argument. the the price of land is less and has been. Um, so and there's some great growing regions in Washington and some great expertise that have gone up there. And um, yeah, no, I agree. And then you, know, you talk about Margaret River in the same in the same way. Oh yeah, Australia. We cannot forget Australia. I yeah, you're right, mm-hmm. Margaret River. Um, what's the the wine that Andrew is loving? The McHenry O'Honan, right? That we've included in a few different yes, things. Indeed. We have those, and 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 like Lewin Lewin, State, yeah. you know, makes makes world class Cabernet, and it's it's fifty dollars. It's a it's a it's a song. Yeah, I think in that fifty dollar camp, I I'm with you. I'm Australia. I'm Washington. We cannot not talk about Argentina which is obviously more Malbec heavy, but there's a ton of Cabernet Franc and a ton of Cabernet Sauvignon. Malbec is still a Bordeaux varietal, so it still counts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think we can't talk, cannot discount Argentina, especially when you're talking about producers like Zuccardi that are in the Uco Valley Absolutely. that are you know, making wines from high elevation vineyards, doing them in a completely unique style and charging like nothing for them. I think we touched on this earlier, but I think the one region that if you like Napa or you like Bordeaux, or you're looking for a rival that I think is like right there is is bulgari oh uh-huh. okay i think I, and i she did I, it she threw it in in a, in a yeah, yeah i mean they're personally like like i love sasakaya i love it when it's aged i love it when it's fresh i think that combination of sun and soil and exposure on bordeaux varieties is like is something magical mm. that um, that toes the line of of Bordeaux in a way, but it's still so unique. They're still uniquely Italian. Mm-hmm. I got to work the harvest at in Bulgari in, in at Sapayo a couple seasons ago, and it's insane the similarities being there at, at, as harvest is happening. Uh, well, I didn't work harvest; I documented for a few days, <laughs> um, so I didn't get too tired. <laughs> but seeing the landscape, seeing everything, the quality of the fruit all that it's very similar to napa in that in that yeah. point but yeah as you mentioned the, the soil like it's and they produce and amazing wines and there's ranges and, too yeah okay. and they've taken influence from bordeaux they've taken influence you know andre chelichev went on there to help you know yeah. guide Misetto. and so they've taken influence from from both of these places and they make wines that are unbelievably like well priced yeah i too. i would like, agree i would agree there's always you. there's always the top dogs but there's 50 40 dollar bottles of of red wine from Tuscany. But even Sasakaya is like not, um, cra- I mean, it's not cheap, but it's not crazy, right? It's like, what, 300 bucks? It, it, it would, 
It would be a second yeah, tier like, in Napa. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, <laughs> listen, $300 is not nothing. But when we're talking about these wines that are coming out of Napa and Bordeaux and starting at 800 bucks out of the gate, you know, 300 is like a steal, right? right? I would also make an argument for for Spain and Rioja in that it has such a the Bordeaux influenced it so much, mm. you know, in their winemaking and using and using oak. I mean, they're it's so distinct using Tempranillo and the different grapes, but it did it does have that connection in a way. Um, and if and if you if you're looking for a vintage birth year and Bordeaux is not available, Rioja is a great place. Yes, to go. very Next. true. Or Champagne, or. Port. Yes. Well, speaking of champagne, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna switch gears. I'll let us kind of like mm. decide on if there's a clear winner on uh, the Bordeaux versus the world category. But champagne versus the world, um, this oh. is one. This is a tough one to do uh, for a lot of reasons. Obviously, sparkling wine can be made in a few different ways. Um, champagne, the OG. Some would argue. Um, I love champagne. I will die on the champagne hill, even though it's Lara's region. I'll still give it to you. <laughs> like champagne yeah. is better than sparkling wine from any other region, and that includes Spain. Um, but I do think that there are some incredible other regions that are doing a fantastic job. Namely, Oregon, California, Tasmania. I'm saying specifically Tasmania, mm-hmm. not Australia. Uh, Italy, the rest of France, and Spain. <laughs> Argentina also makes amazing. Argentina is making sparkling good sparkling. Likes. I'm not throwing them in this in this parade though. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 no. And, and not uh, a lot of it makes it out of there anyway. I mean, for that point, Brazil yeah. also does, but that's not in the conversation. Yeah. Oh yeah, I did forget but the UK. I, my sense, my yeah, the UK makes amazing stuff. Unlike Bordeaux, I feel like Champagne is untouchable. Nobody can make it look at, like that. Look at Laura's and there smug are some face. Examples. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does champagne because you you have the right conditions. The bring right- me the bring me my crystal. <laughs> you guys have to um, watch the video. I, you guys do that. This. Champagne is unrivaled. There's no question. Um, if there's there, that's it is it is not just a place and a, a wine. It it is an idea yeah. that lives in all of us. <laughs> um, but I think there's other great. There's other great values in in sparkling wine. I mean, Francia Corcha used to be a great value. Now those are kind of creeping up in price. Yeah, but Trent, um, but Trent Trent producers like the Ferrari wines from Trento, Trento right, Atalanta are really great. Yeah. Was, so if you're looking at northern northern Italy, is a great um, is a great place to find some beautiful bubbles. And they do use and besides prosecco, they, they use the champagne method. They use the traditional method. I always find that cava can be if you the right producer and you know you mm-hmm. spend a little bit more than your base level cava because they have to be made in the traditional method they 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 can have a ton a ton of character for a fraction of the price mm-hmm. i think cava is great but because of the composition of varietals that they're utilizing it never it will never match champagne and I know you tried to prove me wrong when you were running the Spanish restaurant. No, I don't think it's trying to. God, try this. I don't think it's trying to beat but, champagne, but I think it speaks no. its own own language. It does and tells produce its own great story stuff at that beautifully. level. Beautifully, yeah. Francia Corta in the last five years, uh, because I have a few friends that make Francia Corta, and I spend a lot of time in that area. They have now looked into champagne and brought people like Richard Geoffroy, who mm-hmm. was the chef de cab at Don Perignon for years. For guidance, and there's people like that that are coming in and consulting, and they're trying to find it. I love love what they're doing at Francia Corta, but guys, you're never going to be champagne, right? <laughs> Champagne's the king. I think similar to what we did with Bordeaux, we have to sort of tear out not only price but why we're drinking this, right? Because there's a lot of different reasons you would like. There's only really one reason you're drinking like Bordeaux. You're probably having dinner or you're visiting one of the regions, right? Champagne is like one of the beverages that can be consumed at all times of day without judgment. Mm-hmm. I won't judge you for drinking Bordeaux in the morning, but someone might. <laughs> um, and champagne is kind of, is, or sparkling wine is kind of one of those rarities where you can kind of drink it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so for that reason, champagne, I think there are situations where though it may be the best and though it may be unrivaled, it is maybe not always the best choice. So when you're talking about like it, it kills me when people do like mimosas with champagne. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay, wow. Okay. 
why. That's why you have right. cava and prosecco. And exactly, and I think right. those are the moments where it's like get your fifteen to twenty dollar cava or French Accorda. Like, there's some great ones that wine Ac- and some of the cremants as well that Wine Access has. Like that uh, Henri Champlion is wonderful. It's like a, oh, yeah. a cremant, cremant de Bourgogne, I think, is wonderful. And we have cremant de Loire can be really really nice with uh, you know early in the day or with our you know. And also, like, if you just want to get, like, a magnum of something and savor it, yes, it doesn't have to be champagne. Just, you know, just just for that kind of, like, celebratory act, you can get magnums of, of anything. Yeah. I think when you're, um, when, you're drinking, that when you're drinking sparkling wine on its own and you want to enjoy it, like, you want that, the taste of it, like, champagne, great. Enjoy all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think there's situations for some people because champagne, obviously – we, there's a whole champagne episode you should go listen to. It's great. But we talk about, you know, the fact that it's it's very cold there. It's therefore the grapes are very high in acid. And so for some people, and champagne and sparkling wine are always going to be high acid wines. But if you go to warmer regions and to get sparkling wine, you might find that you prefer it, namely from California, because the acid levels are going to be a little bit lower and the fruit profile is going to be a little bit stronger. And so it's going to feel a little fruitier and a little bouncier, a little bit more like for someone like my mom, for example, my mom cannot do Mm -hmm. champagne, but she loves sparkling wine from warmer regions because it, it doesn't feel so acidic and, you know, zesty for her. So I think that's a situation in which California does. I will say, I think if there were two regions that could compete with champagne, it would be Tasmania and Oregon in like a real way. And I don't know how much Oregon sparkling okay. we've had, but there are- Argyle, we're about to offer oh. it. It's outstanding. Argyle is fantastic. Oh, mama. Yeah. Um, Great value One too. of my favorites, the Grand Marine Blanc de Blanc. It's a vintage Blanc de Blanc. It's still expensive. It's $100 a bottle. And I think that's where you're like, would I still get that over champagne? I don't know. But that to me is like one of- the best examples of sparkling wine that is as close to champagne as you can get outside of the region. Well, we love champagne. There's plenty of it on the Wine Access website. Yeah. <laughs> I know this because I buy it oh, a lot. Yes. Um, but Me if you're too. looking for other things, please do look at Oregon, California. Has Do not ignore Tasmania. House of Aris, Jans, yes. Clover Hill, they're all wonderful producers. In Italy, Prosecco, which is made in a whole different way and a whole different category of sparkling wine. And it's lovely, but it is not champagne. And I want to be clear about that. Uh, Prosecco is its own thing. French Accorda, Trenta Doc, and I mentioned Ferrari, a wonderful producer. Those wines start at like 25 bucks. And yeah, yes. great deal. a really great deal. I do got to make a side note. If you are going to somebody's party and it's more than eight people, there's nothing better than showing up with a magnum of champagne. If it's more people, mm-hmm. you're invited, it Eduardo, and there's right. 10 people well, coming. I, yep. that, <laughs> My my house, <laughs> the cellar is filled with those. Well, not filled. We've been depleting a lot, but we wish. I cannot show up anywhere unless it's a 1.8 liter of sake or a magnum of champagne, so everybody can taste it. And if they like it, have more. Ugh. That's that's. I dropped the mic right there. Ever the guest, ever the humble <laughs> guest. I love it. We are going to touch on Italy, but um, before we get there, we have to talk about Burgundy. I think this will be probably mm. the most fascinating. Um, yeah, we all kind of sat back in our seats and like gulped. Um, Burgundy, uh, land of Pinot, land of Chardonnay. We can throw Beaujolais in there if we want, but why? Um, it's his own thing. <laughs> Burgundy versus Oregon, California, Tasmania, and I am including just for you, Eduardo, Patagonia slash Argentina. All right, mm. all right. I know you're, fancy, I know you're a, a champion of, a, of the South and Southern Americas. Yes, indeed. It's it's a tough one. Uh, there are, I, I, I'm just going to say this, there are generalizations, but I think if we are talking about comparison, it's got to be more about producer specific. Yes. And my point is like, you're looking at Walter Scott in Oregon, you're looking at, um, I mean, you can name a few, but you cannot talk about a whole area because California, for instance, again, we have the climate. It produces richer, bolder styles, a little more generous. And that's what the, the customer has been asking for. When are you choosing Burgundy? Let's start there. If I know that I'm going to get a full glass of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I love Burgundy. And Burgundy is this, it's, it is, um, 
it's like a never ending quest on discovery in, in such a small region through the lens of two grapes. Um, I drink Burgundy every chance I get because I feel like I just, I, you, you just never, you never, you never know it enough yeah. and you have to experience it's it. It's also Russian roulette. So, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. And you, you need to, you, and the only way to like figure it out is to be tasting a lot of it and drinking a lot of it, which is hard. And so you, so yes, um, never turn down Burgundy, but I do love, like, let's, you know, let's talk about the U.S. I love the range through those two grapes, the range of wines that can be produced. Like, you can do through Chardonnay, a Chardonnay and that Pinot. is clean and mean and just and an, an, an aged in stainless, and it's got, like, this super, like, laser acidity to it. And then you can do these richer Fuller styles. And you can produce all of that in, in the United States. And so you can show, like, just a range of styles and climates through one grape same with pinot noir um so i feel like the like the the variety you have to play with in the new world with these grapes is is interesting um and the but the focus in burgundy is you know what you get at in that in that small area is is unbelievable i love burgundy but i i feel like it's a it's a toxic boyfriend. And no. <laughs> I really like, I want to make the relationship work. I want it to, because we've had, we had great moments and I remember them well. No. <laughs> there have been so many bad ones and I'm like, Ugh! like, I don't, it hurts every time. And you, like, you guys know it, like you're rolling your eyes, you know what I'm talking about. And like the thing mm-hmm. with Burgundy is like, yes. it's so producer specific. It's so vintage specific. And it's also yep. like it's so fickle. Like it really depends on the day that you open yeah. it, whether it's going to be good or not. And to me, like as a consumer, I could not buy a bottle of Burgundy without either one knowing that it's going to be a gamble, or two being so secure in my purchase that I know I can't lose. And that's not really a possible thing to have in with burgundy and so for that reason to me that's pycm what's that i can always do pycm <laughs> right i, I, I have, like, every you, PYCM, I have a whole I've cellar never been full fooled. of it just hoping that it's gonna be great because it is that's a very consistent producer but you know but there's still the risk there's right? so yeah. and there's so much bad burgundy we actually had this conversation on an earlier podcast and and uh lex nicoletta likened it to like ordering chipotle she was like you just she was like, you just never know if it's going to be a good day at Chipotle. Oh, my God. And it's so true because I was like, you know, Burgundy, like some sometimes it's good and sometimes. And for, so for that reason, like, you know, Burgundy is the benchmark. It's go. It's, it's it's wonderful. Everyone should experience Burgundy and everyone should be so lucky to have a bank account large enough that they can substantiate these massive purchases that are necessary to really enjoy mm-hmm. Burgundy, but most of us are not there. And so for that reason, to me, these other regions are where I'm looking when it comes to Pinot you know, and Chardonnay. I think it's very fair. Um, and I think if you find a producer and a style in the new world that you like, I, you know, because I think just as Burgundy is fickle, like just the grape, like Pinot Noir itself is fickle. So if you yeah. find one you like and you like their style and then in California, in the new world in general, they're going to be so consistent that like, there's nothing wrong with sticking to that and kind of finding things that are similar to it. Without going too far or going too far and Patagonia, there's, as you mentioned, Chakra. Yes. Well, there's Chakra. Yep. That is we had a, always the liver. Yeah. We just had recently the, just had a the shard and so good. Money. So good. They have done I, a fantastic job with what they have. And I, I like, you know, some of the, um, like I like Santa Rita Hills yes. as a as a region for Pinot Noir and, and it's so distinctly yes. not Burgundy and it just got this like it's got this power like CBD but it's still, umami. You know, it's, yeah yeah it's still like super it's one of the longest growing seasons for Pinot Noir in the world and it has so much complexity and it's so unique and I I, I love those wines I love that region if I'm looking for like a New World Pinot and I actually like I like New Zealand Pinot. Oh yeah, I forgot about our kiwis. I'm sorry. Can be kind of can be can be kind of fun. It's super clean. It can be fresh. Um, you know, really kind of like lighter. I like those wines. So, I think there's like a a, a place and time for all of them. Yeah, I agree. I I do think I think that's also the beauty of those two particular grapes, right? You know, can mm-hmm. really as long as it's grown in a good place, like it can really show its terroir probably better than any of the other grapes that we've talked about thus far. Although I guess champagne is technically Pinot Noir, but 
But what would be the what's the funniest thing is that the most uniquely Burgundian thing I guess would be the Beaujolais then. Oh. That is so true. It, it doesn't really it does not it actually does not travel. It doesn't travel. No, which I think is as a, as a, which I think is as true a grape, as a style of a wine like is like that's it. Like if you want Gamay made it in its best, you're only going to one place yeah, in the world. Yeah. No, that's fair. I want to Like I, Nebbiolo doesn't travel. Well, this was so this is where I'm getting right now is okay. Italy is I saved the, I saved it for last, and you can fight me on this. We're all friends here. It's fine. I <laughs> saved it for last because I'm not sure it has any competitors. I'm not mm-hmm. sure that it has equivalents in the way that these other regions do. And so yeah, I'm not giving it to Sir. I refuse to give it to Sir. But <laughs> <laughs> Or yeah, at least let's make them work for it. I mean. Yeah. But – there um, are love letters to Italy throughout the world. There are uh, great anyone can Nebbiola write a love letter in Eduardo. Mexico. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Yeah, tell us, I'm tell just us. putting that on the side. <laughs> nobody compares because nobody has the Italian charm, the soils, yes. the the way things are done so specifically regional to each area. How one place in Umbria does things so different than Montalcino and vice versa, and all these different things. You cannot replicate no. that. I mean, I, I'm sorry to bring this back all the way to Japan, but Japan would be, <laughs> to me, the only country that it's so regional that you cannot replicate things specifically. So sorry, I had to do that. But yeah, Italy just has, you, there's no way. Nobody does the, any other grapes better. Uh-huh. I think you can make an argument that Spain is is also its own self-contained thing. Agreed. That, not, that, that you know, like no one does what Spain does like Spain. Like yes. Tempranillo and with Grenache, where it 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 and is regional and Cava, like they have and Sherry. Mm-hmm. I mean, Spain also is is unique in the world the way that the way that the way that Italy is. And when you think about the way that the culture has identified with the wine and how that's influenced the food, like those two regions more so that because France is so stylized, like Italy and Spain, like it really is so cultural, and that's been everything is tied together. That when you kind of separate those elements out, they're just not the same. Like Tempranillo outside of Spain mm-hmm. is not the same. Nebbiolo outside of Italy, outside, outside of Piedmont, not the same. And I think it's because, you know, as you kind of pointed out, like there is something culturally about these places where like everything just works together so harmoniously that when you see them outside, it just like – it just doesn't really translate. If I'm eating Italian food, there is absolutely – Zero chance I'm drinking anything other than Italian wine. Or sake. Wow. Sake. I'm not drinking sake. Yeah. <laughs> I'll drink it with French shoes and the Moroccan. I that's <laughs> fine. No, it's ha- like nobody's having no, no one is having lasagna right. and sake. It's not happening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Prove me wrong. Yeah. You haven't lived here. Um. You haven't lived. Uh no, but you could say that for like a cut the rhone. You could get a twenty dollar cotterone and have an amazing lasagna with it, but but it's it's that it's that two plus two equals a hundred, you know, where you get with Italian wine and the Italian food. I think you're right. Like it 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 can kind of the sum of the parts are, are greater, but but I do think the flip side of that is true as well. And this is sort of a I don't know if it's a a pro or a con for Italy with Italian wine. There's very few Italian wines that you want to drink without food, like not. Not a ton that are yes. delicious on their own. Like they're they're almost right. universally better with you something to together, snack yeah. on. So right for some people that's a good thing. For some people like that's annoying. If you're looking for the value for white wine, one of the best places to go is Italy. Um, there's just a range True. and a range of prices, a range of styles, and if you find, you know, yeah, if you find the region with the cuisine you're kind of looking for, you know, whether it's seafood or heavier stuff, you just find the wine that's grown there. Yeah. I'm choosing Italian whites over Bordeaux whites pretty much 100% of the time. Maybe not Loire Valley whites. That would be kind of like neck mm-hmm. and neck. Um, but it, it would it would go between the two. Like if I want like a crispy white, I'm I'm either going to have an Italian white or a Loire Valley white. My only argument with that, and I, I hate to be in that hole, but the Loire has become such a, a, a name, right? Starting by Sancerre. Yeah. Everybody knows Sancerre, even if they don't know that's a Sauvignon mm-hmm. block, right? They'll see it on a list. They order it. doesn't matter the price these days. But because of that, because of, of that attention and the great marketing skills, 
there's been a, a lot of producers and overproduced. So sometimes you might find a crappy wine in there. Totally. That was just done in there, right? But Italy, who in the hell, except for a good friend, Dan Petrusky <laughs> and Masican, who is making a Greco? Who's making a Falangina? Who's True. making a, a Tocca, a Friuliano? All these things. So the quality is there. This is like multi-generational producers. And normally from this soils, Nobody's coming in and like, oh my God, everybody's talking about this. I, I would I would just say, be careful with your Pinot Grigio. Yes. Pinot Grigio, it's the exception. Pinot Grigio is That the is exception. a market. Yeah, it's a name. Don't spend more yeah, than so 20 bucks in Pinot Grigio. Try not to spend more than like 15 on Pinot Grigio, but definitely don't spend more than like 20, 25. It's not a... Yeah. Yeah. That That is the... Yeah, the yeah. Because right that, that's become a commodity. But yeah, other, other than that, and yeah, if they're just... We... Honestly, in wine access, it's one of our largest categories because we all love them. Yeah. Because like we all, you know, like I think any other wine shop would be like, yeah, I think you just need, you know, one from the north, one from the south. And we just love those wines so much. Yeah. And we drink them so much that we have like, we'll have like 14 different Italian white wines. Because they're so good. On the site at, at one time. Because so, we, that, feel, we feel they're all different. The and we, there's, a, there's a time and place for all of yeah. them. And it's, it's. I was going to mention, don't drink Pinot Gris. Uh, if you're at a wedding and your choices are like Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay, I actually go Pinot Grigio over Chardonnay because it's like mm. it's usually cheaper to make and yep. it's harder to f up. But uh, along the same lines, one ice cube, exactly. Yeah, get club soda, lemons, whatever you got to do. If you are planning events, i.e., weddings, parties, whatever, Italian white wines all day long. Italian wines in general, but Italian yep. white wines especially, they tend to be slightly lower alcohol. They're crispy. They're delicious. Um, they're like university appealing and like a lot of times they'll have something like really fun going on and someone would be like what is that that's I didn't expect that this way was delicious this conversation was so much fun thank you I hope everyone listening enjoyed yeah, it but sure even if you didn't we had a I had a really good time I feel like I don't get to like yeah, be unsure about wine this. oh uh, this yeah is, oh Laura this I love that delicious. you got to refill thank your you glass so on this show how fun oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well I mean I'm in California time so it is all good for me. That's right. Yeah. That's right. End of the day. Um, and I'm sure you have to get back to judging some more um, hybrid varietals from Montana or something, right, Eduardo? <laughs> hopefully, uh, yeah. hopefully more fun yeah. stuff. But yeah, sake, uh, Think- sake is in the right. horizon. Well, thanks for doing the someone's Lord's gonna, work for us, Eduardo, and finding all the good, yes. good things. Um, I'm sure, th- I'm oh, sure that guys, people Oh, guys, I had so much it. fun. Thanks for the yeah. invite. For everyone listening, thank you so much. If you are not a member of the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast Wine Club, now's your cue. Everything's down in the description. Get in on it. We've got a new shipment coming up soon. Our next episode is also on Chardonnay, and I'm very excited about that because we have Ooh. we we just wax poetic about Oregon Chardonnay, and that is what's featured in the next um, in the next episode. So you have that to look forward to. And if you are not subscribed to this podcast either on YouTube where you might be watching our faces or wherever you get your podcast, please take a moment to do that. And uh, like I said, leave us a, a five-star review. That's so helpful. All right, you guys, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all being here and um, we don't have a winner, but if you want to follow what's going on on Instagram to see who, who, who everyone decide, who the, the socials decide is the winner, then you should absolutely do that. It'll be a little heated. It could get heated. Yes. It could, it's going to be fun. We've got a lot of, a lot of like surprises in store. So definitely follow us there. Um, all right, you guys. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.